All right, well, welcome everybody to uh, our latest session on uh, ORG 448 Emerging Markets. Uh, today's session is gonna talk a little bit about uh, macroeconomic trends in emerging uh, markets. And uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Frank Jürgen Richter uh, to, uh, to this uh, program to share a few of his insights and uh, comments about uh, emerging markets. And uh, as a way of getting started, uh, I wanna briefly introduce uh, Dr. Richter uh, he is uh, currently the chairman of uh, Horasis and also the founder of the Horasis Global uh, Meetings. He was a former director of the World Economic Forum from 2001 to 2004. And I should say that our paths crossed early in, uh, in the 2000s back in, in South Korea. I don't remember the exact setting anymore, except that uh, it led to a, a book that was published in 2005, Korea Confronts the Future, that was uh, co-edited by uh, John Barry Koch and Frank Jürgen Richter. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have a, a book chapter in there. Um, and over the years, uh, we sort of kept in touch and uh, I was fortunate to be invited to some of the Ross's Asia meetings. And um, I'm sure um, if uh, you would like to talk a little bit about that, uh, that would be great. Uh, Dr. Richter has a degree in industrial engineering from the University of Karlsruhe. He did academic studies in, in France and uh, Mexico, pursued PhD studies at the University of Tsukuba, and earned his doctoral degree from the University of uh, Stuttgart. Um, and uh, with that, uh, welcome, uh, Frank Jürgen. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to, uh, to see you again. And um, as a way of getting started, I, I would invite you to maybe Share a little bit about uh, Horasis. What is Horasis all about? What's the vision? What's the uh, the, the mission statement? Uh, and then we'll take it from there. Thanks so much, uh, friends, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, time is flying since we met, uh, I think, almost um, 20 years ago in Korea. And uh, at the time, you know, um, people even talked about Korea as an emerging market. We know, of course, uh, Korea emerged like um, many other countries. Uh, and we see um, a shift in power, uh, you know, between emerging markets and the established countries of the West. And it's maybe, you know, the, the arena uh, for us is, is working. We are connecting countries. Uh, we connect people with different opinions. We are nurturing dialogues. Uh, so what we are doing, we host large-scale summits um, a bit all over the world. Uh, prior to Corona, I have to say, of course, we can't host uh, meetings uh, those days. Uh, but uh, we host uh, meetings on China, India, Southeast Asia. We host a global meeting, and, um, and currently we're working also on an Africa summit. Um, so we are always um, inviting um, heads of government, ministers, and CEOs, entrepreneurs, um, to um, share the platform uh, and to talk about the future. Our vision, actually, and our mission is to inspire the future. We want to come up with solutions how to improve the state of the world um, and to advance uh, the global public good. We very much believe in private public partnerships. Uh, we believe that entrepreneurs should always think about the long term um, in, in a way how capitalism works, giving back to society, even has a bit of an altruistic uh, mindset. And um, yeah, you know, with, with Corona, we um, um, uh, nurtured our own digital transformation. Now we are hosting our summits online. Um, uh, just uh, around four months ago, we hosted a big summit on the uh, digital sidelines of the UN uh, General Assembly and um, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, attended. Uh, we had um, five heads of states, um, many leading entrepreneurs, including um, Richard Branson, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that you have been part of our meetings, Francis, and I look forward to your participation in our next meeting, which is focusing on the US on the 18th of March. And uh, it's the first time we are hosting a meeting on America. And uh, this maybe brings us back to emerging markets uh, in some way, because uh, we see that um, America uh, is still the leading superpower in the world, but uh, its kind of power and influence is waning, especially in the last four years um, with uh, a president in power, um, at the White House um, who wants to make the country great again, but um, sometimes on the uh, expense of its trading partners, especially Europe, but also Asia and uh, also the emerging countries. 
um, there's a, a conflict between US and China. You know, um, people say we move from a trade war to a tech war. It's really a, a war for influence and, you know, who holds um, um, or who, who is really ahead in, in terms of artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain, um, uh, anything um, digital. Uh, so it's a very interesting world. Um, if you look into emerging countries on the one hand and the established countries of the West on the other hand. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, where we are. And um, uh, I guess you have many other questions, so please go ahead. And I think it's great to have uh, a bit of you know, a dialogue and uh, to learn also from you, Francis, because you're a very seasoned uh, professor and academician. All right. Well, since since, since you mentioned uh, China already, let, let me maybe start with, with that country, um, a country that recently actually, according to Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg's latest categorization of, of the top emerging markets, interestingly enough, was only on number 17, uh, which was uh, quite surprising. The top two were uh, Thailand and followed by Russia. And that was also, uh, I think, somewhat surprising. But when you look at China today, uh, especially in the context of post, well, not necessarily post COVID-19 just yet, but uh, with, with that in, in mind and uh, the, uh, the slowdown in the Chinese economy over the years, what, what's your take on, on the prospects in China? What are the challenges that, the, that China is facing as, as an emerging market? If we can still look at it as emerging, some might say it has already more or less emerged. It's definitely, as you mentioned, a peer competitor in the technology realm now with the US where we are more or less engaged in that, in that tech war. But what do you see as the, the prospects or, or the challenges for a country like China? Well, um, China um, got already his, uh, its new normal, um, and let's use um, this expression coined by President Xi Jinping, the new normal uh, started already some three, four, five years ago, uh, when China's growth rates went down from you know, double digit first to 7% uh, now to 5%, uh, and even lower now with COVID. But um, it's um, a reduction in growth, but um, it's an increase in the quality of growth because China is now very much uh, focusing on uh, its own intellectual property. Um, you know, in the past, people said, oh, you know, China is just copying, it's a copycat. Uh, and there has been a lot of fear that China is kind of, you know, uh, getting into the market with cheap products and destroying industries in the West. Uh, now um, they say, oh, you know, now China uh, is, is a top innovator and it's even more dangerous. Uh, and, you know, we have um, companies in the um, telecom era like Huawei, um, which are, you know, world leaders in, in um, you know, the next generation in, in uh, 5G technologies. Uh, in AI, you know, likewise. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, China is everywhere when it comes to tech. Um, even, um, uh, you know, uh, in terms of e-commerce, uh, China is leading already. I think, you know, uh, also, you know, digital payments, you know, if you take Alipay, for example, um, and other similar products, uh, China is definitely leading in the world. You know, when you go to China, um, even like uh, on the countryside and, you know, get some uh, renminbi um, in your pocket, you, you can't really use it anymore uh, in, in restaurants, right? You, you have to use Alipay. Uh, and, and it's quite striking, you know, um, uh, the way how, how China advanced. But in a nutshell, um, China is already um, emerged. Um, it's uh, a leader uh, when it comes to technology, but there's still a lot of issues. There's a divide in China between all you know, the big cities and, and the countryside. You know, I travel a lot in China. I've been to almost all provinces and I've seen people still living in caves. Um, and, uh, you know, very simple conditions, even, you know, leaving Beijing or Shanghai and you drive like two hours, right, and you're in a different world. So there's still a lot of um, work to be done. And um, I think, um, you know, China has um, one big advantage, of course, is the top-down approach, a very long-term orientation. In the West, you know, there's always changes in government. Uh, that's not like this long-term vision. Um, you know, in China, there's uh, the, the famous museum on the future in Shanghai, where you can see how the future will look like. Uh, you can't find similar things in Europe, you know, where you usually, you know, look back into our, uh, the glory of the past. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very um, China bullish. Uh, the current crisis in America is, is helping China. Uh, and, you know, there have initiatives like One Belt, One Road, 
reaching out in infrastructure, helping countries uh, in Central Asia, uh, even in Europe. You know, Italy, for example, uh, joined the One Belt, One Road initiative um, to the kind of um, dismay of the European Union. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we see um, other countries in, in East, Eastern Europe, um, almost under Chinese control uh, when it comes to investments. Um, and uh, we see that China is very much playing with soft power. Yeah, even the media and, um, you know, the, the film industry, you know, we have a lot of Chinese production. So it's no longer just the American taste, but also the Chinese taste. So in, in, in terms of the, the connection maybe between China and other emerging markets, do you see now a trend? There has been a lot of discussion over the years, and maybe it was more academic, about um, you know, the when it comes to models of development, for example, that, well, the, the Western, the Anglo-Saxon model is maybe not as um, as attractive anymore. The Washington consensus certainly took a huge hit after the 2008 financial crisis. Do you see a trend of, of uh, the up and coming countries maybe gravitating a little bit more towards a, a China-like developmental model, especially since a lot of those Emerging markets are, as you mentioned, wrapped up in, in the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, yeah, definitely, you know, um, Anglo-Saxon capitalism, which is usually, you know, short-term oriented, um, is giving way to a more um, Asian approach. And you can say Asian approach, it started already in the 1950s uh, with Japan. Um, uh, at the time, the uh, famous NITI in Japan, the Ministry of, um, of Commerce and Planning, um, they basically um, created a model where the state is heavy-handedly in investing in certain industries, um, pushing exports, um, also forcing foreign com uh, companies to set up joint ventures, technology transfer, uh, and then uh, over a while kind of um, uh, changing the model where uh, their own companies reaching out and export um, and become heavyweights on their own. And, you know, the, the Koreans... Um, follow this model, uh, the Taiwanese, um, uh, then the, the so-called four tigers um, uh, in Southeast Asia, and, and finally also China. Um, so uh, this is happening, and uh, we see also more and more um, state intervention um, in Europe. Um, so um, continental European countries um, also leave the kind of Anglo-Saxon model and have more state intervention. Uh, that's happening. But what's also happening is quite interesting is that uh, Chinese companies actually, they um, more and more use American Western models of management uh, on the corporate level. And, um, you know, capitalism is, is um, omnipresent in, in, in China. Uh, it's no longer socialism, as we know. Um, and maybe the Chinese are the best capitalists in the world. You know, they are entrepreneurs. They have, um, entrepreneurship in their DNA. We see it also in Russia. You know, Russia is a very capitalist country uh, when it comes to the initiatives um, of entrepreneurs setting up ventures and having uh, and, and trying, you know, to be on their own and even apart uh, from, from government. So you see both trends. Yes, you know, the state is intervening, but uh, the entrepreneurs um, want a freedom and um, they, for them, you know, the world uh, is big. It's not only their own country, but uh, Chinese entrepreneurs you can find all over the world. So usually they go for a, a double listing, maybe back in Shanghai and Shenzhen, and then go also to the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and uh, yeah, um, uh, it's it's um, capitalism at its best. So it's interesting you, you sort of highlight sort of the combination of I guess it sounds like state capitalism and um, entrepreneurial uh, dynamism. I'm wondering if uh, sort of in, in the context of COVID-19, if you look at, uh, at the emerging market landscape, do you see that uh, some of those emerging markets are focusing now more on state capitalism or to what extent are they also laying the foundation for more entrepreneurship? Uh, the reason I'm asking this, uh, there was a, a report on Channel News Asia out of Singapore recently. And Singapore, I guess, uh, according to MSCI index was still classified as an as an emerging uh, market even though it's it's a very developed uh, country uh, but they had an interesting report about how COVID-19 also opened new opportunities for uh, entrepreneurship um, so do you have a sense of the kind of entrepreneurial dynamism that is happening in emerging markets is it being facilitated or are there some roadblocks that are still 
hampering it? Well, um, yes, definitely governments try to uh, nurture entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, a very good example is Vietnam. Vietnam is also on the winning side um, uh, with COVID. Even you know, prior to COVID, a um, lot of Western companies relocated their manufacturing site from China to Vietnam for cost reasons. Um, also because they have much better access to young, well-educated um, engineers. Um, you know, one region we are working with, and you attended um, our last Asia meeting, um, Francis, uh, is the region of Fenzhen, uh, north of Ho Chi Minh City. And uh, for them, you know, entrepreneurship is really the mantra. Uh, uh, would like to attract their own young people uh, to set up ventures, but they attract also foreign direct investment um, in, a, in a very big way. Um, and uh, they might, you know, emulate the success of Shenzhen and, uh, you know, the uh, southern Chinese uh, special development zones. And uh, it's a lot of fine tuning, you know, how much kind of guidance are you giving um, to the entrepreneurs, uh, putting infrastructure in place, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, and also, but also the grassroots development. So it's top down and bottom up. And I think you need both. Um, even the Silicon Valley, you know, developed like that initially. Um, you know, uh, the defense ministry, Pentagon, uh, invested a lot in Silicon Valley. You know, it has to do with also with um, uh, military uh, technology and later on chips for computers. Uh, and only then, you know, the, the, the tech giants like Apple and later on Facebook uh, came up. Um, so you need uh, a certain level of um, state intervention. Uh, we see it also in Africa. By the way, I'm very um, Africa bullish, talking about uh, emerging markets. Um, Africa really is a new frontier. Um, and uh, you know, you see a um, uh, fantastic entrepreneurial success um, in certain countries. Um, take Rwanda, for example. Rwanda, of course, has a very you know, um, controlled economy on the one hand, uh, but uh, also one which is really uh, nurturing entrepreneurship. Uh, or take a place like Ghana. You know, Ghana is, is a bit like the, the new Switzerland of, of Europe. Um, and um, so the governments in both countries try to put the, the kind of frameworks, maybe in a Singaporean style, you know, putting the right conditions, you know, for taxes, for infrastructure, for living conditions, uh, but then um, let it, um, you know, leave it to the entrepreneurs uh, to really, you know, go and run yourself. It's interesting that you should mention um, Africa, actually, since I'm actually this semester in, in my home university teaching a, a course on uh, on African history and politics. And we will also focus on, on emerging markets and that the concept there. And uh, Rwanda is going to be one of the case studies that we are using. I'm using the book Rwanda Inc. And there's a very interesting book that came out last year in 2020 called Africa First, uh, about how to ignite the, the growth engine. So a lot of the points that you mentioned um, are, are discussed uh, in there. But st sticking with Africa then for a moment, uh, Africa might be home to a lot more of the maybe so-called frontier markets as well. Um, so obviously there's a lot of potential uh, for Africa. What do you see as the likely hurdles or challenges that might still prevent some of those countries from fully capitalizing on their latent potential uh, in, in Africa? Right, you know, first of all, um, I should say that um, Africa is, is good news. Um, just think about, you know, the new um, free trade zone in, in Africa, which just started actually 11 days ago on the 1st of January. Um, the um, Secretary General of this new African free trade zone attended our last um, um, Horasis meeting. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. You think about, you know, the 55 countries in Africa are now one big economic bloc. Um, the big hindrance so far uh, was that there was no kind of unified or united market. Um, even, you know, flight connections are so bad, you know, when you fly from A to B, sometimes you have to fly back to London or Paris. Um, and, uh, you know, I experienced myself in the last um, three years, I, I traveled to around um, 35 African countries. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and I've been to Africa before, uh, I think only three or four countries are missing now. Um, and uh, I always went, you know, strategically, like six, seven countries in a row, and uh, planning flight connection was so difficult, meaning, you know, there's no connection, and uh, sometimes the border areas are even dangerous, think about what's happening 
in the Sahel zone, you know, in the area between Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso, you know, it's it's uh, uh, some it's a land not controlled by anybody. Um, the second big challenge, you know, um, um, uh, is is still corruption and the rule of law. You know, in some countries, um, it's 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 not really working, and um, you know, there's so many. You know, uh, people are always asking for you know something from the left to the right, but you know there there, there, there are great exceptions. Um, I've been last December um, to a country which is uh, barely visited. I've been to Benin or Benin um, in French, um, you know, just uh, north of uh, Nigeria, and in this country is amazing. You know, I think uh, many people even don't know where it is. Uh, but um, it's, it's, I would say, almost corruption-free. Uh, they're building our infrastructure, they build five-star hotels, um, and uh, there's a very natural transition of power, you know, from one to the other without like a, a coup d'etat in between. So there are, there are a lot of uh, uh, bright spots. And, you know, one big advantage um, of Africa, obviously, is the, um, um, uh, the demographic dividend. You know, a lot of young people um, and you know the missing of um, formal employment opportunities means that uh, those young people are kind of forced to become entrepreneurs. And uh, you know entrepreneurship sometimes comes from this you know uh, need to survive. So you 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 know you go for the last mile and you just decide to build your own company. And that's happening now in Africa. You see it everywhere. Right. And then it's interesting, we, we will highlight the, a lot of the themes that you just mentioned in, in our uh, course as we go forward as well as I mean, corruption would be a, a big one, certainly. Um, some of the, the success stories in, in Africa, we will, will highlight uh, when it comes to technology, we see a lot of technology leapfrogging. I think that's the thing that a lot of emerging markets are sort of benefiting uh, from. Um, Kenya, the, the big case study that is all, always being proposed there in academic circles seems to be M-Pesa, the mobile payment system. Um, if, if you had to look at sort of the emerging and frontier market landscape in general, would you dare make a prediction as to what you think would be the next sort of breakout countries that we should be really focusing on, the ones with the, the biggest potential? Right, you know, it's difficult to highlight uh, one or a few. Do you mean in the African context or in the um, overall, a anywhere in the world? If you just look at emerging right. markets in general, right? Yeah. So um, uh, you know, Africa. You know, there are a lot of um, candidates. You know, you mentioned already Rwanda. Uh, we mentioned Ghana. Smaller places like um, uh, Benin as well. Even you know, like uh, big countries like Nigeria, which have you know. Um, Gigantic problems, you know, uh, corruption, but also, you know, being um, uh, a country with so many different beliefs, people, and tribes, uh, and unity. But you know, the country has uh, immense potential. You know, if they get it right, you know, this this country will be a star. But it's still uh, uh, some way to go. Um, um, if we just um, change continents um, for a moment, um, you know, Latin America has always been a, an underrated uh, continent. And people say, oh, you know, they've gone from crisis to crisis, there's hope in between. And just at the point, you know, when they reach a level of development, there is another big crisis. And, you know, Argentina has been in crisis um, for, 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 you know, I think 100 years now, right? And uh, Argentina at one point, was uh, the richest country on earth. It was like Dubai uh, 100 years ago, where everybody went, right, and said, you know, that's the great place, and you see what happened. But uh, in Latin America, there are some places also with huge potential, um, you know, Colombia, for example. I think, you know, they're really at the tipping point. Um, I'm not sure, friend, if you've been to uh, Medellin recently. Medellin, uh, the connotation tells us it's all about, you know, um, narcotics and, and uh, you know, um, their main uh, export product um, uh, is, is illegal, uh, but it's something of the past, you know, nowadays um, Medellin is, is a bit of a Silicon Valley where even, you know, young Europeans and young Americans go because it's so dynamic. So there are, there are pockets of um, development uh, or, and, uh, you know, uh, of potential or even in, in, in Latin America. Um, Asia, and uh, we are both old Asia hands, so to say, and we lived in Asia. Of course, Asia is, is a no-brainer. You know, there's so many interesting countries coming up. Uh, Vietnam, we mentioned um, um, already. Um, uh, some countries um, have um, difficulties um, over the years. Um, 
you know, Philippines was like uh, up and down, and uh, you know, there are also, of course, um, governance issues. But you know, Philippines could also uh, great potential in, in the future. Um, uh, likewise, um, Indonesia. You know, of course, Indonesia is a very you know large country, but if they you know um, get it right, um, also a lot of potential. Uh, so all work um, in. Uh, in Asia, you know, personally, I'm uh, a fan of small countries, small nations, you know, I'm based in Switzerland, and uh, uh, I look always into um, small nations, uh, because, you know, you can basically do so many things in, in a small country, and, and take Singapore, you know, what they did, uh, that started like um, 40, 50 years ago with, um, you know, Lee Kuan Yew, basically at the time, you know, uh, uh, it was just a big scram, and um, there was no infrastructure and, and they made it. And I think many countries now use the Singapore example of you know, how to leapfrog uh, even in a smaller country. Since we haven't really uh, focused too much on, on Latin America, but since you brought it up, um, I think one of the countries that, um, and I liked your point about focusing maybe on, on smaller uh, countries. So those are usually the ones that might be actually overlooked in, in the process because we always seem to gravitate towards the bigger ones. When we think of, for example, the um, the, the BRICS uh, term or BRIC as it was initially called in, in 2000 by William O'Neill of Goldman Sachs, right? Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and then they threw in South Africa later. If you look at Brazil, I think that fits that um, uh, sort of description that you had that uh, the perception seems to be you know, from a lot of people that in Latin America, we just sort of gravitate from crisis to, to crisis. And uh, Brazil, I mean, it, I guess it still deserves a lot of attention because it obviously has you know, a potential and has a, a technology sector and has natural resources. It has a large population, although a lot of them are still in, in poverty. But Brazil has been maybe, uh, and I would like to get your take on this if I could, do you feel it has been uh, overhyped in the past? Uh, th there was an interesting book I read once that was titled Brazil's Second Chance. And uh, one of the lines in the book was that uh, Brazil is the land of the future and it will always be so. So in a way, the, the, the potential is there, but for some odd reason, they never can actually capitalize on the, on the strengths they have because something is holding them back, whether it's institutional right. weaknesses, corruption, with the, uh, the the car wash scandal is just the latest one that we heard, you know, coming out of Brazil. How do you feel about um, you know Brazil going forward? You know, personally, um, I love the country. Um, of course, you know, it's, it's a great culture, a great music, great food, and most importantly, uh, great people. Uh, but uh, you're right. You know, um, Brazil so far was always um, you know the dream, the country of the future. You know, the the possibility, but it really didn't happen. Even so, you know, there are pockets of excellence, you know, take a company like Embraer, you know, in, you know, uh, manufacturing planes and uh, smaller planes and you know, the market leader in, in what they do. So it, it's possible. Um, and they've got their own uh, big, you know, uh, domestic market, uh, which is a huge um, advantage. Uh, they've got, of course, um, uh, you know, the, the Amazonas area with, with uh, forestry. Um, so, you know, uh, it's an amazing country. Uh, I think the main problem of Brazil is that they always shift from the left to the right in terms of politics. And I mean like the extreme left and the extreme right. But there's nothing like, you know, um, in between. You know, you, you go from one extreme to the other. Um, and, and that's dramatic, you know. Um, how can you um, govern a country on the long term, you know, when you always go to the extreme? So I'm a fan uh, of the middle way in a very Asian concept, right? It's just to mm -hmm. go avoiding the extremes when it comes to economic policy. Uh, you can't say today, you know, you are nationalizing industries and then, you know, we go into kind of um, uh, Manchester or Chicago um, type of capitalism on the one in, in one second, right? Uh, it, it doesn't work. And what Brazil really failed to do is to bring wealth to the masses and to bridge the divide. You know, there are uh, incredibly wealthy people in Brazil uh, but then, you know, people live in favelas. Um, and, you know, what I've seen on my trips into Brazil, to Brazil and other Latin American countries, you have a street. On the one side, you go to favelas, and on the other side, the, the villas. And it's just one street in between. It's, it's striking, right? And, and yeah, they have to get it right. And they need um, people at the top whose, like, main intention and main mission is to bring wealth to the people. 
And then I think Brazil and other Latin American countries can really thrive. So uh, maybe as as a as a closing comment, then because I know your your time is precious. The the point that you just made about Brazil, sort of the 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 divide, the the inequality, sort of side by side, you know, the the haves and the have nots. I think that um, sort of allows us to nicely sort of complete the circle and come back to to China, what what you initially started with. When um, when we look at emerging markets, there's a lot of well economic growth, growth potential. And of course, everybody expects that, well, I'm going to cash in on that economic growth. My standard of living will increase as well. But the challenge, of course, is always that not everybody will benefit or reap the, the rewards early on. It's uh, as the late Deng Xiaoping had said, right, it's it's OK for some people to get rich first. And that might be OK as long as you can ensure that down the road, the current have nots will actually uh, enjoy the the fruits of, of their labor as well um, and I think that is something to to keep in mind with uh, when we look at emerging markets in terms of the uh, we want to look at the long-term uh, potential then the policies are they geared towards uh, eventual redistribution of, of wealth or are they pursuing an inclusive development uh, um, agenda so I I, I think you gave us a, a very, uh, very concise, very quick, and yet very compelling global overview in, in, in a way. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, if, if you have any last minute uh, comments, uh, feel free to, to share those. Otherwise, we might uh, close this conversation. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Francis. Um, I very much enjoyed the discussion, and um, I agree with you. Um, in your conclusion, also again, you know, portraying China, you know, when Deng Xiaoping um, uh, had his famous trip to the South, you know, the Shenzhen some um, um, 30 years ago, actually now 40 years ago, um, he basically said that, you know, uh, we, we need a more capitalist mindset. And uh, if you don't have entrepreneurs, right, we have nothing to share. Um, uh, China was able to bring uh, wealth to everybody. You know, you can't really see such um, divide like in Latin America and in China, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very kind of balanced um, society. Um, uh, but, you know, um, on the future, um, uh, one last thought I want to share is that we might actually enter um, a phase of high growth, what I would like to call the Roaring Twenties, similar to the Roaring Twenties uh, 100 years ago, you know, after the First World War, uh, we had um, the Spanish flu, as you know, um, and uh, it was a disaster, uh, and uh, you know we lost so many million of people, actually many more than in war. But after that, you know the world uh, started to move very fast. It was actually like a renaissance, uh, you know, uh, with with um, big cities booming, investment booming, entrepreneurship booming, uh, stock exchanges going up. Um, the Roaring Twenties, also in terms of um, capital, in terms of culture, music, and the arts. Um, but then um, something happened, you know, uh, there's been a lot of excesses, uh, we went too far, and then we went into the uh, Great Depression of the late 1920s. So I hope uh, we can avoid it this time with a bit more of um, foresight by um, the right people um, leading us um, with entrepreneurs, um, understanding that we have to invest, invest also in the global public good, uh, and not just, you know, in our own pockets. Uh, I think then we can uh, avoid those excesses, but still reap the benefits of the growing 20s. Sure. And, and that is actually a very nice uh, uh, closing comment because it makes a very good connection to the uh, material that the students will be um, uh, viewing later today in my video lectures, because I will focus on rapid economic growth as a destabilizing force. So that uh, the reference to, well, the growing 20s, and then we took it you know, too far is, is a very nice sort of uh, way to get students to think about, you know, the, the potential is there, but yes, it has to be uh, sort of deliberate growth and inclusive. And I think the, the reference to entrepreneurship, that might be a topic that uh, a lot of students may want to explore. You know, what is the, the entrepreneurial capacity? What is the entrepreneurial opportunities that, are, that exist in emerging markets? Or how do governments go about actually laying the foundation uh, for that? So I, I appreciate your, uh, your insights and especially um, uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to share your thoughts with us. I'm sure that the students will, uh, will enjoy um, watching this uh, 
uh, interview. And um, I'm sure I'll get uh, a lot of uh, interesting comments from students. So once again, uh, Frank, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, uh, Francis. Uh, good talking to you and wish you a good interaction with your students later on. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. So.